Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to the SJ3D ECR Astronomers in Australia seminar series. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Simpson. I am a postdoc at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Uh, before we begin, it's important for us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first astronomers. And we acknowledge their long-standing systems of knowledge on which we continue to build. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we meet today. I'm speaking to you today from the land of the Wollamidigal clan. Uh, our first speaker, Jake Clark, is speaking to you from the country of the Jeebal and Jarawar people. And our second, second speaker, Stephanie Monty, is speaking from uh, Gunnawal country. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Peoples joining us here today. Uh, so why are we here? So this series is facilitated by Astro 3 d the ISC Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions. COVID-19 has affected our ability to travel and present at international seminars this year um, and last year. Uh, and especially for us in Australia, the time zone differences often mean that often meetings are taken place at two or three in the morning in our time. And this lack of opportunity to network could disadvantage junior astronomers entering the job market. And so what we're going to have today is two talks over the course of this hour. Uh, each talk will be 20 minutes in length with five minutes for questions at the end. Uh, please save your questions until the end of each talk and feel free to use the chat function to ask your questions if you prefer. Um, and I can read them out from the speakers. Um, these talks are going to be recorded and will be put on um, YouTube after this for educational and scientific purposes. And by being here today, you're agreeing to abide by Astro 3 ds meeting code of conduct. Um, and I've already told the speakers this, but because of the limitations of Zoom, I'll actually have to interrupt them verbally in the middle of it with five minutes left to warn them about the time. Um, so that's all the housekeeping. So on to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Jake Clark from the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, Jake is a planetary astrophysicist who discovers and characterizes worlds beyond the solar system. So Jake, you can share your screen and start talking. Brilliant, all right. Well. Uh, G'day everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming along today. I know it can be early uh, for some of us here. Um, so I'll see how we go uh, for a 6 a.m. Uh, speech or um, seminar today. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Gaibal and Jaiwa people on the land in which I'm uh, coming from to you today and pay respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging. And would also like to thank Astro 3D for this amazing opportunity. Um, so my name is Jake. I'm a PhD candidate based at the University of Southern Queensland. And ever since I was a little, little tacker, I would go out to my suburban backyard, uh, stare into the night sky and just ponder what else is out there. And I'd ask myself sort of questions like, are we alone? And even though we're decades away from trying to answer this particular question of whether or not there are, there's life elsewhere in the cosmos. What we do know is that in terms of being alone, if we're the only planetary system out there in, this, in the Milky Way, well, we're not. Um, we have just passed an absolute landmark uh, achievement in the exoplanetary science. And that is that in the last month, uh, we have surpassed over 4,400 exoplanets. And now at the moment, we have over 6,600 exoplanetary uh, candidates waiting to be confirmed. So these are events um, that are planetary-like and it's up to ground-based astronomers like myself to help confirm them. So all up, we are now, we have now surpassed over 10,000 that's right, 10,000 um, events that, are either, that have either been confirmed as being exoplanetary in nature or waiting to be confirmed. And this number is only going to go up and up thanks um, largely to NASA's tests and Kepler missions. And the test mission I'll be talking a little bit, a little bit about in a sec. So you can see here that over time, um, the field has grown exponentially in the last 15 years and particularly in the last uh, Sort of six years where, where we sort of saw, saw a doubling in the candidates from say uh, 2015 to 2016 
And we're only seeing, sorry, in confirmed exoplanets, I should say, and we're only going to see this continue to rise. And you can see here that the two dominant ways of actually finding exoplanets is through the radial velocity technique and the transit photometry uh, technique. And the transit photometry technique is by far the most popular way to find exoplanets. And here is the test spacecraft. And it was launched three years ago and has now confirmed over 130 exoplanets to date and has over 3,300 candidates waiting to be confirmed. And so that number has now, um, is now greater than the K2 and Kepler candidates and test is still ticking along. So, and now that it's flipped to uh, observing the ecliptic now, it's going to find more, more than ever. So for those that haven't, uh, that uh, just need a fresh, fresh number of uh, how to find planets. So this is the transit photometry technique. So as the planet passes across the shadow of the star, you'll see a change of flux in that starlight. And if we see periodicity in um, that change of flux, then um, we can say that there might be an exoplanet orbiting around this particular star. And then also with the radial velocity technique, Brilliant technologies, uh, love and life at six o'clock in the morning. Here we go. Uh, so this is the radial velocity technique. So as the star and the planet orbit around the very center of that uh, system, that starlight will shift um, peri periodically towards blue wavelengths as it moves towards us and red wavelengths as it moves away from us. And we can see um, this, this uh, phenomena on with ground-based telescopes. However, um, we, yes, we can observe this phenomena um, either through transit photometry or through radial velocity measurements and using models to help find the planet. But fundamentally, what we also need is we also need the stellar parameters that come with, with those observations as well. Because all of those measurements that I just show, shown you are all relative to the host star. And so if you've um, underestimated the size or mass of that star, and all of a sudden that star has increased in size and mass, then also that leads to the planet also increasing in mass and size as well. So trying to get fundamental parameters of, um, sorry, getting fundamental stellar parameters is incredibly important because when you combine these observations all together, then you can get the mass, the radius and density and through stellar abundances, I was talking a bit about in the sec, uh, you can talk about the composition, you can then look at the period and how far away the, star, uh, the planet is away from a star and Hubble zone. And you can start to make a, a better picture and better understanding of this planet's place within its planetary system and whether or not life could potentially be sustained on such a body. And I've never seen a plot like this before um, until making one. And so the most rave Apogee and Galar are the four biggest um, stellar surveys that are currently in operation or are coming to an end at the moment. And so you can see here that they cover the vast majority of the night sky. And so it's, it's a no brainer then to actually use large scale surveys like this to, uh, to do exoplanetary science with, whether or not it's better characterization of the stars, which leads to better characterization of the exoplanets or whether or not with some of these surveys, you can also get the stellar abundances and the stellar abundances are incredibly important to try and determine the composition of terrestrial, um, terrestrial worlds. And so here is the same image, but I've just sort of uh, made things a little bit less messy. Otherwise, if all the colors were, were there, uh, it would just be very, very noisy. But what I'm showing you is the huge overlap with the third data release of Gala and the um, and the test mission. So every single uh, sort of uh, tessellation in orange here is a test sec uh, is a field of the one of the test sectors, and then every sort of purple dot here is a um, is an observation of Gala. And you can see here, so there's an overlap of the fields on the top here. So this is a continuous viewing zone for the northern hemisphere, and down here is the continuous viewing zone for the for the Southern Hemisphere. And there was a deliberate, um, there was a deliberate 
observing strategy to observe the continuous viewing zone because we knew that Tess is going to be observing that point and trying to better characterize those stars. So during my PhD, I'm I've been trying to answer two fundamental questions. And that is, what can we learn about current exoplanetary systems orbiting around stars that Galar has observed? And what can we learn about the type of planets Tess will discover around Galar stars? And so I'll start off with the latter and get back to the former. So at the beginning of the PhD, I was able to use Galar DR2 uh, data, use the effective temperature, surface gravity, the uh, ion abundance and alpha abundance, um, along with Gaia DR2 parallaxes and magnitudes, along with uh, two mass magnitudes, and put that into a software package known as isochrones, which uses isochronic modeling to determine the mass, radius, luminosity, age, and Havel zones, et cetera, for, uh, for those stars. And so with that catalog, I was able to create, say, catalog with 47,000 stars, um, which are now being and have been observed by TESS. And it also comes along with 23 abundances and also with four key abundance ratios. And these abundance ratios, uh, again, um, aids planetary scientists in terms of determining the geological composition of said worlds. And so now you can get onto Data Central and download the data. And if you have any trouble, please contact me and I can give you the uh, data directly. So what did I learn from uh, collating the test Galar catalog? Well, I found that the choice of stellar parameters matter. So here I'm showing the planetary mass and planetary radius. Um, and so what I wanted to know is that if you had, if you use the parameters from my Galar test catalog for a Earth size and earth mass planet, how would that vary if I use the test input catalog instead? And so each of these gray points here is what an earth like and uh, sorry, an earth mass and earth size planet would be um, if you were to change the stellar parameters. And you can see here the large diversity of such a world. And so what I'm trying to show is that stellar parameters matter in terms of being consistent. And if you've determined uh, the size and mass of a star and being consistent with it, then you can be consistent with the uh, planet, planetary properties as well. And as I've mentioned, the stellar bonuses can help with the composition of, de oh, sorry, determining composition of uh, rocky worlds. And what I was able to determine was that with the carbon to oxygen and magnesium to silicon ratios that I was able to determine from the Galar abundances that the exoplanets that are likely to be discovered around glass stars are going to be comp uh, compositionally diverse from those found within the solar system. So those found within the solar system are known as magnesium rich um, planets because the magnesium to silicon ratio is greater than one. Um, however, there is, a, uh, there is a regime here you can see in purple where the magnesium to silicon ratio is less than one where you're going to get silicon rich worlds and then uh, beyond with the carbon ratio of point, uh, point zero 0.08, you're going to get carbon rich worlds. Um, and so it might be more complex than just sort of equating the stellar abundance ratio to the planetary abundance ratio. As um, Adabikian has seen, there might be a slope or with uh, Plotnikov and Valencia, they're seeing that there might be, there's uh, variances there between the stellar abundances and the planetary abundances. And then also thinking about devolatization um, with uh, Wang et al. 18's work as well. And we can see here the diversity of the stellar abundances across the Galar, um, the Galar survey here. So this is uh, the sun's uh, abundances. This is the Earth. And for example, Mercury sort of sits around here. So you can see here as well that Mercury is quite unique. So if you find worlds that are sort of akin to Mercury, there's probably some sort of secondary processes there that is, that's driven that, um, that planet's formation. And now with the rise of DR3, that's come out uh, earlier this year with Galar and Gaia EDR3, I've been able to go back and refine just the plants that have already been confirmed or the uh, planetary candidates within Galar DR3 and using the same processes as they did using the Galar um, test catalog. And so I've been, I wanted to know if there were any test candidates or K2 candidates that were beyond the sort of radius limit of two 
uh, Jupiter radii, that's probably the limit as to where exoplanets can uh, form and you will lead on to say uh, brown dwarfs from there. And so I've been able to determine that some of the tests or K2 candidates are likely to be brown dwarfs or binary systems. And also what's great now is that the expansion of the NASA's exoplanet archive. And now with the NASA's exoplanet archive, not just having a single value for a single planetary system, they've now included all of the data for all of the planetary systems. And so what you can do um, is that you can use a weighted mean approach. And by that, I mean, you can collect up all the independent radial velocity, uh, sorry, all the, the radial velocity semi-amplitude um, observations that are used to determine the mass of the exoplanet. You can uh, use a weighted mean approach to calculate just one single value. And then from that, your that should give you a more precise um, value of what your semi-amplitude would be, which then leads to more precise values of your mass and radius values, which can then lead to better constraints on the composition. And so this is the pl uh, plot that I've created for my paper that's currently in review. And so you can see that for some planets here, uh, so for K K2314b, there's just a simple shift in its parameters here, but we can see here for Corot 7 b there has been a sub substantial uh, increase in the precision of uh, this planet's mass and radius. And to the point now where um, uh, it's beyond that, say, 1.6 radii limit that we think where planets might transcend from being rocky worlds to more uh, gassy worlds or a layer that's uh, so their radius might be dominated by an atmosphere. And we know that Corot 7b has a surface temperature of over 2000 Kelvin. And so this is telling us that there must be some sort of atmosphere. There must be some sort of atmosphere uh, to, to reason such a, such a, such a radius. Um, but I'm still, still trying to work that out. I'm trying to talk to exogeologists on that one as a real head scratcher. So uh, stay tuned for that one. Or if you have any ideas, uh, please let me know. Um, and also with the iron abundance and alpha abundance, uh, what I've been able to do is that Dai uh, et al. 2020, uh, they show with TOI, with the discovery of TOI 1440b, that ultra hot, uh, sorry, ultra short period Neptunes uh, favor iron rich stars um, as, a part, as opposed to their terrestrial or sort of rockier uh, counterparts. And so what I've been able to minutes. do- Oh, five minutes, brilliant. Yeah. Um, and so what I've been able to do uh, is I've been able to use the iron abundance and alpha abundance from Galar as well, and look at if there's any type of correlation that I can see there. Now they only had two, uh, sorry, three planets uh, in their survey, sorry, in their um, sample that were ultra hot Neptunes. And you can see here the ultra uh, hot Neptunes that are in sort of orange uh, circles here. So my mouse has gone missing. <laughs> there we go. Um, here and here, and so they they do favor more iron rich environments compared to their um, smaller counterparts, but it is a small sample size at the moment, so it is tough to say. But uh, Dyer sort of went on to say that the formation of ultra short period Neptunes might be very similar to that of ultra short um, period Jupiters and hot Jupiters as well. So stay tuned for that one. And so what I wanted to do with the Galar um, data as well is that I wanted to work out, well, if, can we work out through the radius values that we've uh, got and the planets that have yet had mass confirmations? Can we get the mass? Can we determine a mass, which will then determine a RV semi-amplitude to sort of better characterize, okay, is are these planets suitable for, sorry, uh, yeah, are these planetary candidates suitable for RV follow-up? So we have the RV semi-amplitude on the x-axis here, and we have the stellar rotation V sine i in kilometers on the left-hand side. And there aren't many exoplanets within this realm here. There's only a handful of exoplanets underneath all of this. Uh, and so trying to determine exoplanets within this regime here, especially up here, is going to be incredibly difficult, especially as the stellar rotation uh, is is a lot faster. The lines that we use, the precise lines that we use to actually determine the radial velocity to the precision of tens to meters per second gets incredibly difficult. And so as you get up to say 30 kilometers a second for say an F type star, 
um, the radial velocity precision that you can get is into the tens or if not hundreds of meters per second. However, it can be done. And so this is a planet that I'm currently following up with uh, Minerva, Chiron data, Coralie data, and Tres data. And you can see here that the host V sign I is about 30 kilometers a second. Um, it is a uh, big, big old uh, Jupiter. Um, and that is currently going through, um, well, I'm almost finishing up that paper now. So stay tuned for that one. So lastly, what I'm gonna leave you with is trying to better characterize exoplanets. We can use large, whoops, what are we doing? Whoops, sorry, I don't know what's happened there. What's that? Let's go back. Okay, can we see the screen? Yes. Awesome, awesome, sorry. Um, so to better characterize exoplanets, we, can, uh, we need to also better characterize the stars that host those exoplanets. And then we can use galactic, uh, large scale galactic archaeology surveys and large scale uh, stellar surveys to actually characterize the stars, which then characterize the exoplanets. And an amazing paper that sort of does all three is, um, is Carrillo et al. 2020. And there are many uh, papers that sort of do all three, but I think this is an exciting time within the field to try and work out the galactic context of uh, this, the stellar populations, which then lead on to um, understand, better understanding exoplanetary populations. And there are now sort of exciting surveys where they're trying to search for the first ever exoplanets in the thick disk and in the halo. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all cool and exciting stuff. So this is my uh, too long didn't watch if you just arrived. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, fire away. Um, and if, if you've got sort of longer questions, then feel free to email me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, all right, so we have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand or use the chat function. I'll start with a question that, um, in terms of the change from the DR2 stuff to the DR3 stuff, was it mostly driven by Galar or Gaia, or was that complicated because Galar improvements are driven by Galar improvements? Uh, Galar improvements are driven by Gaia improvements. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Um, I think there was be there's better improvements with Galar, with Galar, which was also driven by uh, Gaia EDR3, and then with the announcement of Gaia EDR3. Um, data, it's just sort of a no-brainer to just sort of update update these worlds. And I think what's great about Galar DR3 is the inclusion of stars that were observed within the continuous viewing zone. Um, because in my first paper with uh, Galar, just using Galar DR2 data, there were only, I think, 10 confirmed exoplanets with that have been detected. And I think the majority of Sorry, the reason being is that um, the magnitude distribution of Galar is between 10 to 14 magnitude. And as someone who tries to follow up exoplanets, you're really, really struggling uh, to get mass measurements at a, at a VMAG of say 11 and a half and, and, and beyond. Um, but with the continuous viewing zone and also with the um, K2 Hermes survey that was also included in Galar DR3, that opens up to not only uh, candidates that were observed by TESS, but also candidates that are observed with the, uh, with the K2 mission and also with the continuous viewing zone that explodes uh, the number of uh, planets and candidates that you have. So I think within the second paper that I have, there are over 400 um, confirmed planets and candidate planets within that. I think there was about 150 confirmed, sorry, almost 200. Um, confirmed exoplanets with, within Galadia 3, which is incredibly exciting. And then with TESS observing those sectors, I mean, I'm sure that there's got to be more exoplanets within, within Galar that will be confirmed so sooner rather than later. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Dag in the chat. Can you talk about the composition curves, i.e. the dashed lines across some of the plots? 
Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I sort of brushed over them. Uh, where are we? Oh, uh, okay, brilliant. Um, so the dashed lines there um, are curve lines that were derived from Zane. Um, so he was able to determine if you were a big ball of iron uh, on this along this line, um, if you had a mass of nine, uh, of nine Earth masses, you would have, and then trying to determine the radius of said iron ball with uh, nine Earth masses, you'd be about 1.4 um, Earth radii. And then similarly, we have a sort of an Earth-like composition uh, here within this along this dash line here. So if you sort of lived on along this dash line, your composition, your sorry, your geological composition would be akin to that of uh, Earth and Mars. Um, and so similarly here with this dash line here, you'd be 100% uh, olivine and it just goes up into um, sort of less dense, uh, less dense substances. So up this line here is half water, half olivine, and then you get up to a big old ball of ball of water <laughs> just sitting around in space. Um, and so they're, they're more or less just guides, um, just the guide as to what potential composition these planets could be. Um, but that's where those stellar abundances really play a huge part into trying uh, detangling the planetary composition because what can what can happen is that you can have an Earth size and Earth mass planet and you can have various compositions that also add up to a one mass and one Earth sized uh, planet and so yeah that's where those stellar abundances really come in and better determine what the composition of these worlds uh, likely could be. I was going to ask it, but there was only 10 seconds left, but you answered the question of how, how basically how degenerate are those curves between various compositions, but yes, you answered that, so that's good. Well, um, uh, all right, so we've, we've run out of time for questions, um, so we'll thank Jake again for an excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah.